Good afternoon and welcome to Capital Account. I'm Lauren Lister here in Washington, D.C. These are your headlines for Tuesday, June 5th, 2012. MF Global's creditors could have more than $3 billion in claims against the failed firm. That is according to the creditors, bankruptcy trustee, former FBI director, Louis Free. Guess who's not in the front of the line for it, according to Free's report? Customers, who else? And this is, of course, out after a report yesterday from the other trustee, James Giddens, the one for the customers. Lots to unpack here. We have just the guest to help us do it. Author and former Goldman Sachs managing director Nomi Prinz joins us. Also, G7 finance chiefs reportedly held a Eurozone crisis conference call today as Spain's Treasury Minister has sent up a flare saying, help us, the country is shut out of the bond market. The Treasury Minister and reportedly some of Spain's bankers want the EU to help recapitalize struggling banks. Easy for them to say a bank rescue for them comes on the backs of taxpayers, of citizens. We'll ask if anything could turn that dynamic around. And could the way one cash-strapped city and others are trying to fill a budget shortfall backfire? Could it incentivize disaster and destruction, adding fuel to the fire, quite literally? We'll explain. Let's get to today's capital account. Oh, we have so much bad bank behavior and so little time. I guess the question is where to start. We have MF Global, Bank of America, also the government, of course, the Treasury. So why don't we start with MF Global? Because the trustees of the now defunct firm have come out with reports, both of them this week already. Uh, their interests, remember, are at odds. One is working for the creditors. One is working for the customers. The findings in James Giddens' report, which points fingers at or the finger, I guess, at John Corzine and MF Global execs, raises a lot of questions. This is the trustee for the customers. Among them, this report finds the underlying liquidity problems at MF Global did not commence in the fall of 2011. Rather, liquidity had been a cause of concern before and throughout Mr. Corzine's tenure at MF Global, yet systems and tools that would enable accurate real-time monitoring of liquidity were never implemented. So let's just take one angle on this. MF Global did not have proper internal systems in place, but remember, the Federal Reserve approved them as a primary dealer not long after John Corzine came on board. That was February of 2011 that the New York Fed announced MF Global had received this designation. So this status allowed the firm better conditions in borrowing. It allowed them to trade directly with the Fed as a counterparty, giving them the ability to take more risk. Now, we know how that all ended up. So let's talk about what this uh, means, what questions it should raise. We have just the person to do that. Nomi Prince, senior fellow at Demos and author of Black Tuesday, also formerly at Goldman Sachs in a past life. So Nomi, thanks so much for, for being on the show. Welcome back to Capital Account. So nice to see you again. Oh, thank you. Great to be back again. Uh, let's start with uh, MF Global, with this trustee, with the revelation that I just brought up, that MF Global had liquidity issues long before the fall of 2011, did not have the proper systems in place to, I guess, gauge this. What kind of questions does that raise then, that they were granted this primary dealer status, uh, and questions about what that enabled them to do then? Well, yeah, starting with the primary dealer status, um, that is something that the Fed can either choose to bestow on a company or, or not. And as we know, they chose to bestow it. A lot of that was because with John Corzine coming to the helm of MF Global, uh, he had behind him all of the relationships, the bravado, everything that came from having been an insider in Washington, having come to Washington from um, a co-CEO position at Goldman Sachs and so forth. So he was able to really persuade for his company the Fed into granting this status. And, and what it means is 
that the company has more access to cheaper funding. If it has cheaper funding, it has more money to put on any betting table. Um, this, this is prevalent throughout the banking industry. Any, any bank that has that kind of status has more of an inside track, more of an open door into cheaper funding. And that is one thing that, that MF Global had. Now, with that cheaper funding, with that stamp of approval mm -hmm. from the Fed, MF Global was also able to make bigger trading um, trading transactions. It was able to bring in additional customers. It was able, more importantly, to get credit lines mm -hmm. from the big banks. Mm -hmm. And those credit lines and those big banks are what took their money when things turned sour from MF Global first. And those are the banks, those are the creditors that are first in line mm -hmm. to get anything back mm -hmm. after the bankruptcy ahead of, as you mentioned in the opening, the customers. Right. So a really important distinction and a really important uh, change in status that the Fed gave to MF Global. And let's talk about what we what we know happened. But what is reiterated in this report is that not only was Corazine acting as CEO, but he also traded actively on its behalf through a specially designated account. Now, this is bizarre because at the end of the day, he's running a futures uh, commodities merchant. Uh, but is it kosher? And if it is, would it have needed to be disclosed? Was it disclosed? Um, because of the immense amount of deregulation that has happened in the financial industry, the kind that leads to a company like MF Global being a government securities premier uh, listed agent, means that really he did not have to disclose Maybe he should have for ethical reasons to allow his customers to know he was potentially trading with their money, which he says he wasn't doing, mm -hmm. which, as we know, he was. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, he was. Um, but in terms of the actual regulations, the fact that he as a CEO also might have a position as a trader or as head trader or whatever it was he was doing in between is on that gray line of, ethical behavior versus legal behavior, and it's not necessarily something that legally mm -hmm. needs to be disclosed, although, of course, it had ma major ethical ramifications and also led to the illegal mm -hmm. taking of customer segregated funds to back the bets that John Corzine was indeed making. Right. And then also in this report, I guess it was interesting that James Giddens did point the finger at John Corzine and at other executives and said he believes he has a case at least to sue them for breach of fiduciary duty, for negligence. So if he has the, the dirt that he needs to have these claims to sue these executives, including John Corzine, where are the criminal charges from the DOJ or the FBI? The, the DOJ has been ridiculous on all of these situations that have occurred in the financial industry. There, there have been no criminal indictments of any of the leaders, mm -hmm. the leaders of the companies that have done so much speculation and that has gone so wrong and that has lost so much money outside of the lines of any kind of fiduciary responsibility throughout this entire period. MF Global is, is one major glaring example of the DOJ falling down on its job and the FBI. We are talking about monies that went across state lines, that went across countries, you know, that went over the ocean into the UK and so forth. This is technically an FBI matter as well. The, this is this is larceny. This is money that disappeared. Now all the language and all the defendants um, on the MF Global side will say, well, like John Corzine says, I didn't authorize the misuse of customer funds. Well, of course you didn't say, hey, by the way, can we misuse customer funds? But that's <laughs> not the point. The funds were misused. Right. And all of the the lines in between and legalities in between will be what you know his side and in in what. Um, the customer side are going to be arguing, but the reality is their money was misused. It was used for margins. It was used to prop up credit lines. It was taken before it should have been taken, and it was used to back John Corzine's bets. He made those bets. He backed those bets. When things were going wrong, and as you mentioned, this was not just something that happened in the fall. It was already happening in the summer. Regulators were asking questions about the bets, and mm -hmm. Corzine was basically saying to the, you know, as, as some of his stewards were at the company, that, that he's got it, that 
that, that things are okay, that he's uh, hedged um, in a lot of these positions and, and that everything will be fine. And of course, as we know, that wasn't the case and more and more money got poured in uh, from the company into the creditors. Um, to allow them to continue to call margins on the company and ultimately everything imploded. Right. And, and as you mentioned earlier, uh, some of this money was abroad. It was in the UK. And I thought it was interesting in Giddens' report, he says that one of the things, one of the three things that needs to happen in order for customer property to be returned 100% of it is contingent upon these proceedings with the UK and recovery of funds. Now, this is the same trustee, I understand, that is on year four of trying to do this with the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy and has received or recovered nothing. So is this right for him to be banking on getting money back from the UK when at best it is a lengthy process, at worst it's going to deliver nothing? Um, it's, it's nice that he's optimistic. I guess, you know, if it gets him uh, energized to continue to fight for, for customers' funds to be returned, that's great. But yeah, the reality is he's been doing this for four years with Lehman. It hasn't happened. And, and a lot of that is because you have this David and Goliath situation in these um, situations where the customers are very, very last to getting what is owed to them or what in this case was theirs to begin with is, con is still theirs um, as it stands. And all of the creditors with all of the lawyers and all of the big guns and everything else are ahead in bankruptcy court saying, no, we need to get that first. And, you know, there are laws that protect creditors and so on and so forth. Well, there are also laws that protect customers. But because MF Global operated, as do many companies, across all of these different regulators and across all of these different rules, move monies back and forth and through companies like J.P. Morgan Chase on the way and so forth, it's hard to get that pinpoint of accountability and, more important, relinquishing of customer funds before the creditors who are fighting like mad on the other side are trying to get any of their money back. Right. And in these long fights, one thing we do know for sure is this amounts to millions and millions of dollars in fees for these trustees and these bankruptcy attorneys that are overseeing it. So if it's a long battle, they're going to get a lot of money. I know James Giddens, you know, hidden kind of is, or not the headline, is that $17 million has been the cost that he's incurred already or has asked for, I think, through February. Now, uh, really quickly, before we go to break, and we're going to talk more with you after break, let's quickly touch upon uh, some other executives presumably behaving badly because it's come out in a new lawsuit in federal court in Manhattan that Bank of America executives painted a rosier picture of the losses from their acquisition of Merrill Lynch back in 2008 knowingly. Now, on its face, it looks like Bank of America execs are the bad guys here, but is the story more complicated than that? Yeah, that's a really murky issue. Ken Lewis, as the CEO at the time of Bank of America, did preside over Bank of America when they acquired Merrill Lynch. You know, that, that, that we know. Um, but Merrill Lynch, who at the time was headed by John Thane, who was a former head of the New York Stock Exchange, former um, senior executive at Goldman Sachs and so forth, was running a company that was staggering from CDO and various types of derivatives losses. When the deal to acquire went down in the middle of September of 2008, mm -hmm. the deal that Bank of America made to purchase this very troubled company that, that as we saw, continued to plummet in value as the deal details were being discussed, at $29 a share, which was 70% higher than it was even trading in the market before and during the time it was tanking in the market. Wow. So, so that is something that, that Ken Lewis, uh, you know, used basically his company to buy at an inflated value, even mm -hmm. if all the information were true, Merrill Lynch. So that's number one. That's definitely his fault. No, but me, I let believe me, let me that what went you, down let me pause behind you for the one scenes second. also was no, that me, nobody let me, wanted to let Merrill mm -hmm. Lynch fail. And you know, Hank Paulson, Treasury Secretary, Ben Bernanke, Chairman of the Fed, were like, we cannot have a really big bank like Merrill Lynch fail. You know, it happened to Lehman, it happened to Bear. We're not going to let it happen to Merrill Lynch. And plus, John Thane's our guy, so we're definitely not going to let it happen to Merrill Lynch. Who can take him? Well, J.P. Morgan had just you know, agreed to take mm -hmm. Bear Stearns. Citigroup was a disaster. It had to be Bank of America. And in that process, um, whether Ken Lewis knew or didn't know or was subtly or not so subtly implored to not disclose the true condition of Merrill Lynch. I think there was a lot of people involved with that information being withheld from, from shareholders who mm -hmm. approved the merger mm -hmm. um, and that it was irresponsible the Fed to allow the merger 
to take place, although, of course, they pushed it. So a lot, of, a lot, of, a lot of culpability here. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about some perverse incentives at play, too. We will have more Nomi. Hang on right there. We'll have more with Nomi Prince, author and senior fellow at Demos, after the break. Also, still ahead, forget Grexit and Spexit. Some have called for a Cal exit, but where could California turn for a currency? We'll tell you about one town solution in loose change. But first, your closing market numbers. drives the world. The fear mongering used by politicians. Who makes decisions? Considerable breakthrough has already been made. Who can you trust? No one who is imbued with a global missionary zeal. Where are we heading? State controlled capitalism is called fascism. When nobody dares to ask, we do. RT question more. You know how sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know? I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. Welcome to the Alona Show, where you'll get the real headlines with none of the mercy. The problem with the mainstream media today is that they're completely disconnected from the viewers and from what actually matters to those viewers. And so that's why young people just don't watch TV anymore. If they want news, they go online and read it. But we're trying to take those stories that people actually care about and transfer them back to TV. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about the revelations that have come out of a lawsuit filed in federal court in New York about Bank of America and what executives withheld from shareholders about their purchase of Merrill Lynch, which was just losing a lot of money. So one of the other revelations that have come out from this lawsuit is the following. If we could bring that up, showing some of the perverse incentives that may have been in play. It said, while Lewis stated that B of A was inclined to terminate the merger, Lewis also raised the prospect of B of A consummating the merger on the condition that it receive a taxpayer-funded guarantee to cap the losses that Bank of America was exposed to for Merrill's toxic assets. And how much were... So there's a lot of questions that come up from this. Let's bring back Nomi Prince in to ask them. So uh, Nomi, if we could go to her, please. Uh, Given the situation just laid out in that part of the lawsuit about some of the perverse incentives here, how much were banks incentivized to worry less about their own balance sheets and more about being too big to fail so that they have this implicit backstop guarantee of the government? Well, in the case of J.P. Morgan Chase, they received uh, $29 billion of backing from the government, which they still have, in order to take over Bear Stearns, um, which was falling as well and fell as well. Um, in Bank of America's case, when the decision was made that it would be acquiring Merrill Lynch, um, and again, this was in such a dire uh, market at the time that when the decision was made, I think the Fed and the Treasury Department got together and were complicit with Ken Lewis in putting together a bailout or a, or a guarantee package. And what wound up happening was that Bank of America certainly received TARP money. They received bailout money, which was direct to Bank of America's, let's say, top line. But they also received um, a substantial multi-billion dollar guarantee package. And that was connected and would have been connected to Merrill Lynch's portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in one sense, Bank of America didn't have to worry. On the other sense, again, we're looking at a, at a company that they overinflated the price that they paid to get mm -hmm. um, and that was failing daily at the time. So mm -hmm. even if there was to be backing by the government and the government was pushing this merger, Bank of America was still culpable in, in ultimately agreeing, although 
there was a very strong push from the government to make the agreement happen. So this is really a situation of, of major complicity mm -hmm. of the government taking the risk in order for Bank of America shareholders effectively to take over Merrill Lynch, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately pulling the plug for that risk. At this point, a lot of those guarantees don't exist anymore, and yet the portfolios and the securities that Merrill Lynch had at the time are not necessarily much better. Some of the losses had already been taken, but some are still there, lying kind of dormant and mispriced mm -hmm. inside of the bank. Right. And we know that in any of these bailout scenarios, the loser is always taxpayers, citizens, and I'm wondering if some news out of Europe could actually reverse this a little bit. So we know that Spanish banks right now are kind of the banking system du jour to be asking for or possibly needing bailouts or, or recapitalization. But I thought it was really interesting, an article in the Wall Street Journal talking about some legislation that the European Commission is proposing, and then they're planning to propose it tomorrow, according to this report, that would change some of the rules. And it would give nations more sovereignty and more ability to uh, what sounds like unwind banks before they collapse. And what it would allow them to do is essentially have bondholders take hits. And this would change the tides to where investors take losses and not taxpayers. It would also allow them to replace management before a bank fails. Do you think that anything, any kind of legislation could truly change this dynamic so that it, it is investors taking the hit and not taxpayers? Well, I think it's it's a good try. I mean, technically, in the United States, there is an FDIC that's supposed to help to work out banks that are facing bankruptcy so that depositors are safe and the bank unwinds. And, and as we have seen, the smaller banks have had to unwind or fail or go bankrupt, and the larger banks get the government backing. So for Europe, um, where governments have already stepped in to back some of their banks um, into this crisis. For example, in Ireland, the government had decided a few years ago we're going to back these banks to the tune of an amount of money that has only continued to increase um, so that, you know, the governments are kind of in this position where they don't really want their banks to fail even though they're allowed to make them fail. Because if a bank fails and the bank's holding government debt and now the debt gets dumped into the market and the government now has to pay more to run its country because now its debt is lower priced and has higher interest rates, then, then all of what is happening right now continues to happen. So the governments, if they were able to unwind and did have the ability to unwind, would have to have the guts mm -hmm. to unwind. And, and so far, with the capacity they have, you know, to date, they, they haven't made the moves to do that. They've made the moves to allow their banks and the relationship between the banks and the government debt to continue to degrade. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. Thank you for making it. Nomi Prince, thanks for being on the show. She's author and senior fellow at Demos. All right, let's wrap up with loose change. Dimitri, Shannon, maybe she's <laughs> training someone. But even with a global economic crisis, it seems the market of luxury is doing extremely well. It's set to hit $1.5 trillion this year. But what are consumers shelling out their cash for? Take a look. Named Kike by local safari guides, she likes to use safari vehicle rooftops to search for game. While guides do not encourage this behavior, it's an exhilarating experience for the tourists. According to the Financial Times, it's experiences like safaris and also yachts and spas that are beating out other luxury items like high-end clothing. So what does this say? Uh, people are worried that you can't take it with you and the apocalypse is coming, so we better do everything that we've ever wanted to do. That's before our cash well, is think, taken away? You no, know, the first thing that came to my mind just now hearing the story is 
it kind of debunks Adam Smith's argument that there's only so much wealth that an individual can accumulate. There's so many coats that you can wear before you keel over. But he didn't factor in this, this new kind of system that we could live in, this global oligarchy, where you have these bank executives that have a pipeline to central banks, and they become really uber wealthy. And then what do they do? They spend it on these experiences, OK? And they go, safaris, who knows? Like, they could go build igloos, have some guy build an igloo. I mean, there's. There's an infinite amount of, of, uh, of, um, of possibilities as far as like with the service sector for these, yeah, you know, pretty soon they can go to, they could go to space. I mean, really, sky's the limit. Well, that's what Richard Branson <laughs> is aiming for. Let's, yeah, sky, yeah. <laughs> let's move limit, into yeah. what's happening to cities which are broke because that's the other dynamic you have here. Many municipalities around the U.S. we know are struggling with budget shortfalls, but Baltimore thinks they have a solution. They just approved. The selling of ad space on fire trucks. Take a look. Currency that in encourages people to spend locally in Davis. Community currency is not a new idea to bolster. Whoops. Another city is coming up with their own currency, but in Baltimore, they're advertising on fire trucks. So the question that that raised for us is does this incentivize corporations to? Start fires I'm to really get their ads well, out the there. I totally think, and especially banks, because they're arsonists. Okay, they love starting fires. Those they do. All right, metaphorically. And, and then now, the literally, taxpayers always put them out. Always put them out. And you know what? I have put in a special request. I don't know if we can get a, a screenshot of this. I put in a special, a special request for capital account to have an ad on these fire trucks in Baltimore because I think I'm going to front run the banks. Okay. And I think that's the smartest strategy for capital account to get their ad space out there. Let the bank start the fires. We capitalize. We bring it to the people. We bring you the news straight from the fire trucks, straight from the burning cities of Baltimore as the banks raise hell quite literally. Yes. And uh, pegging off of the soundbite that you heard just before, that was from Davis, California, where add them to the list of U.S. cities that have developed their own local currency. So the question that came up for us, because we've heard about California's problems, me being a California native, I've, I've always heard about California's problems. We've heard about the California exit scenario. People have said, hey, if, if people are talking about a Greek exit, how about California exiting the dollar zone? So hey, are our cities already prepared? Well, for it. This is for this is the collexit. We shouldn't be talking about Grexit. We're talking about collexit. And this puts you on the spot, Lauren, because this is a very profligate state. You guys live live nice out there in California. You got great clothes. You guys all mm -hmm. go for frappuccinos, cappuccinos, mm -hmm. all those other things. So I think mm -hmm. this is, you know, an opportunity for us to be better off the rest of the country oh, to get rid okay. of California. Oh, all right. Yeah. Besides, we already know okay. that you guys are in Dimitri. danger of sinking into the Dimitri. ocean from earthquakes. I've seen Let that. Let me get in here before we go. Right. You're a Greek. I'm a Californian. Oh, careful. We're from, <laughs> from one indebted area to another, at least California contributes. It's like a it, it's like a country in terms of, of the output. Whereas Greece, sorry, it's not First pulling its weight. Without California, the U.S. Okay. states like Mississippi, they'd all be right. screwed. All right. Okay. Okay. We you pull owe a lot Greece of weight. a hey, big debt for culture we're out of time. and politics. Politics. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Show's <laughs> over. We got to end it there. Messed up. But we thank you so much for watching, and, and you can maybe weigh in with what you think, but for sure, come back tomorrow Collect and watch it. the show. And in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Lauren Lister and give us feedback on the Cal Exit versus the Grexit at youtube.com slash capital account. Watch us in HD on Hulu and come back tomorrow. Thanks so much. Have a good night.